Hello and welcome to Alterations in the Endocrine System and Hormonal Regulation. My name is David Woodruff. We're going to talk a little bit here about some of the different things that you could see happening in your patients who have hormonal or endocrine problems. So first of all, a little bit of background on the endocrine system. The endocrine system is a system of messaging throughout the body and there's controls and there's positive and negative controls over this system that are going to control how much hormone is going to be regulated, how much hormone is going to be released so that we can have internal environment inside the body maintain a home homeostasis. So that's the function of the endocrine system is to maintain homeostasis by controlling how endocrine hormones are sent and how they're transmitted and how much of that hormone is in the body at any one time to control certain functions of the body. So we're going to go through some of those different functions here in a few moments. So what are hormones? Hormones, first of all, are going to be chemical substances that are produced by a specific tissue or an organ in the body. And it could be something that's going to stimulate that organ itself. It could be something that's going to stimulate maybe another organ. So they're stimulators of or either that or repressors. So they could either stimulate or repress a certain bodily function from occurring. Typically, they're going to be secreted in low concentrations. So you don't need high concentrations because hormones are really pretty strong or have a very strong effect on the body. They're going to have both metabolic and biochemical effects, and they're going to be inactivated by the liver. They're going to be excreted by the kidneys. In most hormones, the effect is very strong but the effect doesn't last very long. In other words, this will require a continuous production and continuous excretion of those hormones in the body in order to be able to maintain whatever function it is that the hormone is designed to do. A disorder of any of our endocrine glands can cause the patient to have a problem with their hormonal function. So here's some of the primary endocrine disorders. Problems that occur at a target gland such as the thyroid, the adrenal, or the gonads and it may also originate in the, hypo the hypothalamus, the pituitary, or other target organs. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary are two of the primary organs of our endocrine system that are going to stimulate the release of hormones throughout the body. So that's where their function comes in. And then we can actually have the primary organ itself be involved, like the thyroid gland or the adrenal gland be involved. We can also have what's called a secondary endocrine disorder. This is a problem that occurs outside of your target organ or gland. So for example, we have ACTH being produced by the adrenal cortex. It's by the adrenal glands there, so outside of the kidney. And if we have too much ACTH, be um, Produced. And this doesn't have to happen by the kidney, for example, here. So that's what it's saying, is that ACTH could be produced by other tissues that are going to cause the patient to have a problem that would look like it's an adrenal problem, or TSH, or the same thing with LH and FSH. Hormonal regulation is going to be controlled by uh, typically a negative feedback loop. In other words, it's going to be controlled very much like the furnace and your house is controlled. That's a negative feedback system. So let's say you walk into your house, the house is cold, and you say, oh, wow, I need to turn up the furnace. It's very cold in here. So you go over to the furnace, or over to the thermo therm thermostat actually and you turn up the thermostat now the thermostat is what's actually going to tell the furnace to kick in you don't actually go down and you know kick the furnace in the side and get it to go instead what you usually do is to turn up the thermostat now the thermostat then is going to tell the furnace to kick on and to produce heat after a while you say boy it's warmed up nicely in here and you go back over to the thermostat you turn the thermostat down furnace kicks off and that's a negative feedback system it's a negative feedback system because we are the person who is feeling the amount of heat in that house you are going to be the person who's going to control the system so it's cold you turn up the thermostat it becomes warm you turn it back down so this is a negative feedback system where you're inhibiting something by causing a positive action. So in other words, we could have a high level of a substance, some kind of a hormone, that inhibits another hormone from being active. 
By the same token, you may have noticed that this system, this feedback loop that's occurring when you turn up the furnace, is very similar to a lot of the different hormonal regulation processes that occur in the body. For example, if we were to look at the thyroid gland, we don't just secrete more TSH or we don't just secrete more T3 and T4 in the body in order to increase our metabolism. So the hypothalamus stimulates the release of thyroid regulating hormone, which then stimulates the pituitary to produce thyroid stimulating hormone which then causes the thyroid to make T3 and T4. Very much like your whole furnace process here it's the hypothalamus like the thermostat that's going to control the whole process. So when the hypothalamus turns off like turning off the thermostat it's also going to turn off the thyroid just like your thermostat turned off the furnace. So here's an example on our screen here of a simple negative feedback example. We have a decreased calcium level in the patient's body, so there's going to be a stimulation of the release of parathyroid hormone, which then causes an increase in calcium resorption. We have an increase in our calcium level, which then stimulates parathyroid hormone to decrease its stimulation. Because now we have an adequate amount of calcium, we don't want to keep stimulating parathyroid hormone, otherwise we're going to have too much calcium. So the increase in calcium level in the bloodstream is going to turn off that stimulation from the parathyroid hormone. This is showing an example here of a long feedback, a short feedback, and then an ultra short feedback loop. Again, we're looking at what's happening here with the thyroid. So we have our hypothalamus at the top there. It's making thyroid regulating hormone, which then stimulates the pituitary to make thyroid stimulating hormone. The thyroid stimulating hormone goes down and it stimulates the thyroid to make T3 and T4. So that is our feedback loop. That is our loop there that's telling the thyroid to turn on or turn off. On the other hand, we can look at the picture on the right-hand side. It shows our central nervous system stimulating the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then releases hormones and factors to uh, the anterior anterior pituitary, specifically thyroid regulating hormone. Then the anterior pituitary is going to cause the release of tropic hormones. And in this case here, that's going to be thyroid stimulating hormone to attack or to stimulate the target organ, which is going to be the thyroid itself. In order to turn this process off, the thyroid can't initiate, it can't turn the process off, it can initiate, I guess, but it can't turn the process off directly, it has to go back to the hypothalamus. So now we notice that the metabolism has increased, the hypothalamus is going to then decrease the release of thyroid regulating hormone, and then that decreases the whole process. So what the diagram is showing you is just some ways that we can get the body to turn off or turn on these hormones by way of having certain processes occur and usually what's happening is it's the end result that's occurring that causes the hormone to either be released or to be subdued. In addition Hormones also tend to follow these called circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are a 24-hour rhythm that our body has. Now, if you're a day shift kind of a person, that means that in the morning you wake up. And a lot of times, you, if you have a regular schedule, you may wake up without an alarm clock because that's just the regular time that you're used to getting up. So what does that mean, used to getting up? Well, your body becomes accustomed to the fact that you're getting up every day at 6 a.m. So what it does is it releases these hormones so that you will be aroused at 6 a.m. So if you maintain a pattern like that, then what will happen is you will develop this circadian rhythm. Now, you may notice that certain times of the day, you're more awake and alert than other times of the day. If you're a day shift kind of a person, you're probably most awake and alert in the morning and least awake and alert in the evening. That's a normal process that occurs, and it's the result of a circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythms are going to be controlled by the hormones in the body. And there's a number of hormones that are going to change with our circadian rhythms. Growth hormone, prolactin, are going to change. Thyroid stimulating hormone, and just think about the thyroid here for a moment. Thyroid stimulating hormone stimulates the thyroid. The thyroid produces T3 and T4, which increase metabolism. 
Okay, so our metabolism is going to be different at different parts, at uh, different times during the day. It peaks during sleep and is the lowest uh, three hours before awakening. So our temperature, our body temperature, is going to go down before we awaken in the morning. Cortisol and uh, melatonin are also going to be hormones that are going to be affected by a circadian rhythm. This diagram here is just showing what would happen if you were a day shift kind of person. So let's start out on the left hand side at 6 a.m. The sun comes up at 6 a.m. Your body recognizes the fact that on this 24 hour cycle that's where you're at and it wakes you up. Irregardless, you don't even need to have a alarm clock. It'll just wake you right up anyway because your circadian rhythm is used to or in other words it has regulated itself so that you will have this peak of hormones at 6 a.m. Sharpest rise in blood pressure occurs at 6.45. You ever heard of people having heart attacks early in the morning? and that's because we're starting to get these hormones released and specifically these ones that are causing the sharp rise in blood pressure the high alertness etc are going to be your epinephrine and norepinephrine melatonin secretion stops about 7 30 bowel movements likely about 8 30 highest testosterone secretions about 9 a.m high alertness at 10 at noon you know, a lot of times we had, we're okay till noon and then we start having problems in the afternoon. Okay, you start seeing that the alertness starts to fade off a little bit in the afternoon, but our best coordination is at 2.30 in the afternoon and our fastest reaction time is at 3.30 in the afternoon. I guess that's good if you're driving home from class or you're driving home from work in the afternoon that you'd have your great reaction time. Then. Not so great that driving to uh, work in the morning or to class in the morning, I guess. Your greatest cardiovascular efficiency a muscle strength is going to be at 5 p.m. Great time to exercise if you're one who exercises would be 5, 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Highest blood pressures at 6.30 p.m. and your highest body temperatures at 7 p.m. Okay, this is a uh, 24 hour clock that they're using here. It's also called military time. Uh, that's because they use it in the military. They talk about this. You probably heard people say, you know, 1800 hours and things like that. That's military time, and we use military time in medicine. You're going to find a lot of places do that. Okay, so now we get down to 2100, which is 9 p.m. Melatonin secretion starts about 23. 2.30, that's 10.30 at night, uh, bowel movements are suppressed, and then we get to midnight, and our deepest sleep is going to be at 2 a.m. For those of you who are parents of young children, you're going to know that this is a very difficult time of the night to get up out of bed and have to go feed that little one. So because that's your deepest sleep time and that part's being interrupted. So that's what our 24 hour cycle looks like if we are working a day shift, if we were keeping a day kind of a schedule. Now, what happens if you're working nights? Well, if you're working night shift and you keep a night shift schedule all the time, which means that even on your days off, you're gonna stay up all night and sleep all day. Now if you do that you will flip this and it'll be just the opposite of what we're seeing here. However what happens to most people who work night shift? They try to maintain something of a normal schedule on their days off which ends up resulting in the person flattening out their circadian rhythm and that is associated with, OSHA studies have found that that is associated with more medical problems and uh, a much shorter lifespan. Endocrine problems can come from two different areas. It can come from the target organ. We call that a primary problem, it refers to the end organ. So let's say that, for example, we're talking about the uh, process we already saw before with TSH and the thyroid. Okay, the target organ is the thyroid. It can also be a control organ problem. In that case, when we're talking about the thyroid, that would be the hypothalamus or the pituitary. That's called a secondary endocrine problem. Obviously, it's going to be very important to be able to look at each one of these to be able to find out which one is causing the problem for our patient. And that's why we're going to have to look at some different kinds of information in order to be able to find that. And let's go back to our example there of the thyroid. If we're looking at the thyroid function and trying to decide is it a target organ problem or a control organ problem, we need to look at the T3 and T4, that's target organ, or we also need to look at our TSH level because that'll tell us about our control organ. 
So the pituitary is making TSH. That is telling the thyroid to make more or less of T3 and T4. So that's going to help us to be able to differentiate between the two. Okay, now we can have hypofunction. In other words, we have less function of our hormonal system, and that can be caused by a control mechanism. In other words, the control mechanism itself is not releasing enough of a stimulation in order to get the kind of re the function that we want to have out of that. So a decrease in our stimulating hormone released from the pituitary is going to cause less T3 and T4 to be produced. Or we can have hypofunction, decreased function of the target organ. So even though the target organ, let's say in this case again, the thyroid, is getting plenty of thyroid stimulating hormone, the target organ, the thyroid itself, cannot produce enough T3 and T4. The opposite side of the coin is we have too much function of the organ. Again, sticking with the thyroid here, uh, the control mechanism. So we have an increase in our stimulating hormone from the pituitary. So the pituitary is shooting out too much thyroid stimulating hormone, and that's causing the thyroid to overfunction. On the other hand, we could have a normal amount of thyroid stimulating hormone coming from the pituitary, but have an overactive thyroid. And that's a hyperfunction of the target organ. The pituitary is often called the master gland because it is an organ that is going to stimulate the, it kind of reads what's happening. So the pituitary kind of reads what's happening in the body and helps to control the functions of a lot of our different organs by hormonal control. So now there's two distinct sections of it. There's an anterior and posterior section of the pituitary. And we're going to associate some of our different problems with whether it's anterior or posterior on the pituitary. Well, let's talk about some of these different hormones that are secreted from the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus also, okay, up there in the brain, is helping to control a lot of our hormonal secretion. So let's take a look at some of these different ones. A growth hormone factor, or this is a growth releasing factor, is going to control how much growth we have, how much protein and animalism, or in other words, growth and repair, uh, is occurring in the body. So the more growth hormone we have, uh, the more new muscle we will make, the and those kind of things. You know, they're using growth hormone in some patients in order to be able to maintain a more youthful and healthy and muscular kind of appearance. Uh, nobody knows what the long-term outcome of that is, of course. I mean, in the short term, there's, there's very dramatic and, and good-looking results. But in the long term, we really don't know what the long-term results of that will be. Is it, you know, somebody looks more healthy for a period of five years and then develops all sorts of other cancers and things like that? We don't know because it hasn't been used uh, for a long enough period of time. Our next one here is our corticotropin-releasing hormone, and that's going to release how much corticosteroids are being produced in the body. Gonadotropin releasing hormone, another one of our home hormones that are being secreted by the hypothalamus, is going to be those things, it's going to release those things that are going to be necessary to help to maintain normal function of our reprodu reproductive organs. Thyrotropin releasing hormone, okay, another one of our hormones that's secreted here is a thyroid uh, type of stimulating hormone. Okay, so it's going to help to stimulate how much thyroid stimulation hormone is released. So the TRH is being released by the hypothalamus to stimulate the pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. Pro prolactin releasing hormone. This is a hormone that is going to increase the milk production in lactating women. Okay, so somatostatin is going to inhibit our growth hormone, and PIH is going to inhibit prolactin. So this is a, an illustration here that helps to show where a lot of our different hormones are coming from, the anterior versus the, pituit, the posterior pituitary. So let's take a look, first of all, at the posterior, because it's a little bit simpler. we got less stuff coming out of there. Out of the posterior pituitary, we have our antidiuretic hormone, which is going to go down, and it's going to have a function on the kidney. Okay, remember, antidiuretic hormone, that means if it's being secreted, the patient is not diuresing.
On the other hand, we also have oxytocin, which is being released by the posterior pituitary, and that's going to have an effect on the mammary glands and on the uterus smooth muscle. On the front side, the anterior pituitary, we have our growth hormone. We have our ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone. We have our thyroid stimulating hormone, our gonadotrophic hormones, and then again, prolactin. So that's where our different hormones are coming from in the pituitary. And the pituitary just has to secrete a little bit of these in order to be able to maintain homeostasis in the body. So let's take a look at some of these pituitary problems here. Uh, starting out with the anterior pituitary, we can have, again, uh, as we talked about a little bit earlier, we can have an overactive or an underactive gland. And in this case here on the left, we have the underactive gland with a hypo uh, pituitaryism. And in this situation, we're going to have decreased secretion of all of our different hormones here. Where does it come from? could be from a pituitary infarction, so maybe the patient's got decreased blood flow to parts of the brain, which is causing a pituitary infarction, or head trauma, infections, tumors, you know, would be a very common cause for having either a hypopituitaryism or hyperpituitaryism. So in hyperpituitaryism, now we have too much of our hormones being secreted in the bloodstream, and that can cause a lot of havoc in our patient too. Oftentimes going to be the result of having a slow-growing tumor that's occurring in the pituitary. Let's take a look at some of those problems that can occur when we have hyper or hyposecretion of different hormones. Here's hypersecretion of growth hormone and what it will do is it will cause giantism. So in other words if this is hypersecreting in children that person is going to have an overgrowth. They're going to grow too much and what the illustration here is showing is it's showing the two normal looking people here in the middle. The, the two uh, conductors or policemen whatever they are there in the middle are normal height. And then we have somebody with dwarfism on the right-hand side and then somebody with the giantism on the left-hand side. So underproduction on the right, overproduction of growth hormone on the left. And, and the person obviously grows taller and, and bigger than they should be. And, and I guess nowadays we'd call that a basketball player. Uh, anyway, we also can have acromegaly if we're having an increase in the amount of growth hormone that is being produced in adulthood. And this can cause the growth plates to seal up and can cause joint problems. Here's a picture or a series of pictures of a patient as they go through their lifespan with acromegaly and you can see these changes that are occurring in the bony structures. So here at age 16 uh, her face looks fairly normal by age 33 you can see kind of the overgrowth of the bony structures in the face and by age 52 uh, she has a lot of overgrowth of the bony structures. Now that's not just in the face they're going to have problems with our joints as well. The anterior pituitary, okay, so remember again, this is causing, or this is a situation where the patient can have prolactin being either over or underproduced. But if the prolactin secretion is high, in females that can cause a lot of problems with their period and with uh, uh, being able to get pregnant. In males it can cause problems with hypogonadism, which is uh, the patient having erectile dysfunction and impaired libido and uh, problems with being able to procreate. A situation where a patient can have a posterior pituitary problem where we have changes in the amount of antidiuretic hormone that are being produced. One of these changes is the hypersecretion and we call that SIADH. The definition or the term SIADH is, is just an acronym for syndrome of inappropriate ADH. Okay, so that's where the letters come from. So think about it in terms like this, syndrome of inappropriate excretion of ADH. So we have too much excretion of ADH and we have a high ADH level. All right, well, remember, and one of the things that gets confusing to me is this term ADH, antidiuretic hormone. I actually have to think this thing through on my head uh, because it's not I don't think it's very intuitive, antidiuretic hormone. So if your patient has antidiuretic hormone, that means they're not diuresing. If the patient lacks antidiuretic hormone, that's like a double negative, then the patient is diuresing. So in this case, we have too much anti 
diuretic hormone, which means the patient is not diuresing. They're hanging on to fluid inappropriately, which is going to dilute the sodium in the bloodstream and lead to hyponatremia. It's going to dilute the amount of proteins in the blood and lead to serum hypoosmolality. Okay, remember, whenever you hear the term osmolality, always think of concentration. So serum, hypo, or low concentration because there's too much fluid. And urine, hyperosmolality. Remember, again, whenever you hear the term osmolality, you're always thinking of concentration. So urine hyperosmolality, we're going to have too high or too concentrated a urine in this patient. Other side of the coin, hyposecretion of antidiuretic hormone. We're not secreting enough antidiuretic hormone, which means that the patient is going to be inappropriately diuresic. Most cases of diabetes insipidus are going to be neurogenic. They're going to be neurogenic where the brain is not producing enough ADH. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is rare. It doesn't happen as often. But it means that the kidneys are not responding to the antidiuretic hormone that they get. Possibility of psychogenic uh, diabetes insipidus in, as well, but most of the time you're going to see it's going to be neurogenic. Now the same thing is true with SIADH, is since this is coming from the posterior pituitary, in most cases we're going to have to have some kind of brain trauma, brain injury, brain dysfunction in order for the patient to develop SIADH or diabetes insipidus. The symptoms then would be, remember this patient is diuresing, inappropriately. We have too much urine output. So we're going to have polyuria. Polyuria is frequent voiding. Polydipsia, which means the person is going to want to continuously drink because they're getting dehydrated. We will have a low urine concentration, dilute urine. We will have dilute large quantities of urine. And that, what that's going to look like is it's going to be a very light color. It's going to be almost clear urine. So normally we'd expect our urine to be clear and yellow, like clear so you can see through it, and yellow in color. This is going to be a very, very light colored uh, urine, maybe even clear, maybe even just no color at all to it like water would have. Our serum will have a high sodium level. Sodium level in the serum will be high because the patient is diuresing the fluid out. In addition, the serum osmolality or serum concentration will also be high because the patient is losing fluid. One of the most common reasons why we would see this again is going to be because of some kind of injury to the brain, whether that's head trauma, a brain tumor, or a stroke. It could also happen if we have surgical removal of part of the posterior pituitary. Now that would be done if the patient has hypersecretion of the posterior pituitary. They may go in and remove some of this. Okay, now the thyroid gland, just to get an idea of where this is, this is showing the front of the patient's neck here. And what we're seeing is the larynx up at the top, and then we're seeing the trachea at the bottom. So right between the larynx and the trachea, we have the thyroid gland. On the back side of the thyroid gland, we have the parathyroid glands. So the parathyroid glands are going to be around the back side of the thyroid. Thyroid hormones are produced by the thyroid gland. Oh, surprisingly, huh? About 90% of the thyroid hormone being produced is going to be T4. T4's primary function is to go out into the tissues and sit there and wait for when we need to increase our metabolism locally. So T4 goes out to the tissues, it sits there, waits for when we're going to need it, and then it converts to T3 at the tissue level. T3 is the fuel for the fire. T3 is the thing that's causing us to increase our metabolism. Only about 10% of the thyroid hormone produced by the thyroid is going to be T3. So we're counting on a lot of conversion of T4 to T3 when we need to increase the amount of metabolism we need. Well, let's see how that might make sense. Let's say that you are going to go out and exercise. Well, you go out and you start jogging or you're running and you're starting to exercise and you say, wow, I've been exercising here for just a couple minutes and I'm starting to warm up. 
That's not because the hypothalamus noticed that you were running and stimulated the pituitary to make thyroid stimulating hormone, which then stimulated the thyroid to make more T3. It's primarily because your T4 is getting converted to T3 at the tissue level. Now, after you've been exercising for a period of time, maybe about 15, 20, 25 minutes, you're going to start finding that your overall body temperature starts to increase even more. Now you're starting to sweat and all that other kind of stuff. Now what's happening is we have that release of T3. But T4 is going to start converting to T3 initially, so you start the warm-up process before the thyroid can kick in. Thyroid problems are not just high or low. We have kind of a continuum which her that's happening here with our thyroid. In the middle, we start out with our euthyroid. That means we have normal thyroid function. Let's move over toward the left. So we can have some hyperthyroid function where maybe the person is very slender. So their metabolism is very high. They're very slender and things like that. They're warm. They're one of those kind of people that, you know, out in the wintertime, they're walking around with a t-shirt on kind of thing. Okay, so it's it's not a serious life-threatening event. They're not in that kind of a situation, but they are warmer than usual and things like that. Now we move all the way over to the left side and we're in thyroid storm. Now that is a life-threatening event. This is where the person has a severe hypertension, they're going to have severe tachycardia, and they're going to start to use up glucose at the tissue level and can actually start to decompensate when they get into the thyroid storm end of the spectrum. Now going over the other way, so we have from our euthyroid person, we have decreased thyroid function and we get into hypothyroidism. So this may be somebody who's maybe drowsy a lot, they're tired, they have, uh, they're cold all the time when they have to bundle up and uh, those kind of things. So those are some of the things you see with hypothyroidism, gaining weight and uh, you know all that falls under hypothyroidism. However, that's not a life-threatening event. Myxedema coma, on the other hand, way over on the right-hand side, is is a life-threatening event where we get bradycardia, hypotension, and the patient can actually end up having uh, long-term consequences as a result. So hyperthyroidism, also called thyrotoxicosis, and uh, Graves' disease is one of the particular uh, versions here. And uh, one of the problems that we can see, or one of the results we can see, is this thing here which is the eyes bulging out are exophthalmos and I'm sure I mispronounced that um, but you'll see it as the eyes bulging from the head. A goiter can also be a manifestation of either a hyper or a hypothyroid condition and the goiter is caused oftentimes by the over stimulation of thyroid tissue. So for example, let's say in a situation where a patient has a hypothyroid condition, the thyroid is not producing enough T3 and T4. It's going to be stimulated and stimulated and stimulated. It's going to hypertrophy and become large. In a hyperthyroid condition, the, the uh, thyroid may have been caused to hypertrophy because it's being overstimulated by the pituitary or the hypothalamus. So this is a picture here. It's showing both. We see the bulging of the eyes in the patient. We also see, maybe you can see kind of the swelling of the neck that's occurring there. That's the goiter that the patient has. So let's take a look at some questions here and see how we do on answering our questions. Number one, the nurse is completing a health history assessment of a 42-year-old woman with suspected Graves' disease. The nurse should ass assess this client for... Well, if you answered two, number two there, Graves' disease. Okay, this is a situation where the patient has a chronic state of hypermetabolism. So the metabolic state increases and that's going to produce tachycardia and fine muscle tremors. So our correct answer would have been tachycardia. Let's take a look at another question here. Serum concentrations of thyroid hormones and thyroid stimulating hormones are tests ordered for the client with thyroid toxicosis. Which of the following lab values are indicative of thyroid toxicosis? <laughs> The 
The answer is number four. Elevated serum concentrations of thyroid hormones and suppressed serum TSH are the features of thyroid toxicosis. Present or decreased or absent serum TSH is a very accurate indicator of thyroid toxicosis. Now, remembering that the thyroid is the organ in the body that is going to control our metabolism, it would make sense that if the thyroid was slowed down, if the thyroid was not doing as much as it normally should, then we're going to have a slowed metabolism. So we could expect cool, dry skin and hair, bradycardia, hypotension. Okay, now keep in mind, as you go through your schooling here, bradycardia and hypotension don't fit together. Those two things don't go together. If your patient has hypotension, they should have tachycardia. So whenever you see both bradycardia and hypotension together, we have to think about unusual stuff. Things like hypothyroidism, possibly adrenal insufficiency, or maybe some other conditions like a neurologic condition in our patient. But always when you see bradycardia and hypotension together, we have to start thinking about the unusual stuff. Autoimmune thyroidosis is called Hashimoto disease. Myxedema coma is our severe hyperthyroidism. Now we're getting into real severe bradycardia hypotension where the patient could actually end up going into cardiac arrest. So a thyroid question. A 34-year-old female is diagnosed with hypothyroidism. Which signs and symptoms would the nurse expect to assess? <laughs> Okay, this was a select all that apply, and it's 2, 3, 5, and 6. Clients with hypothyroidism exhibit symptoms indicating a lack of the thyroid hormone. And remember, the thyroid hormone is the hormone that is going to increase your metabolism. So bradycardia, decreased energy, lethargy, memory problems, and weight gain, coarse hair, constipation, and problems with our period are going to also be signs of having hypothyroidism. Calcium is regulated by way of the parathyroid glands, so they're going to cause changes in the amount of calcium we have in the body. So let's start with the middle. The parathyroid glands are stimulating by way of parathyroid hormone. They're stimulating calcium reabsorption and vitamin D hydroxylation. So that we're getting vitamin D and we're getting calcium absorbed. So calcium is going to be absorbed into the bones. So calcium is being reabsorbed or is being absorbed into the bones. And then when we need or we have an increase in our, the amount of calcium we have in the bloodstream, so now we have enough calcium circulating, then that's going to have a negative effect, a negative stimulus, on the parathyroid glands that are going to tell it to knock off how much parathyroid hormone is being produced. So this is a feedback mechanism here. Parathyroid hormone stimulates more calcium to be reabsorbed both into the bone and into the bloodstream and then that's going to turn off the parathyroid gland as our calcium level reaches normal. So as you may imagine in a hyperparathyroidism the patient is going to be reabsorbing too much calcium. So we'll have too much calcium going on in the body. This could be a secondary problem or a primary problem. Most of the time it's going to be a primary problem because our parathyroid has overgrown. And the, the treatment for that would be that we surgically remove part of the parathyroid gland. So this will result in the patient developing a high calcium level. Remember, calcium is necessary for the contraction of the heart, so this could lead to cardiac dysrhythmias. We can also have muscle and bone weakness occurring because we have too much calcium that is now taking up places in those areas where there shouldn't be. Calcium has a kind of an opposite effect on our skeletal muscle than it does on the smooth muscle of the heart. So whereas calcium is necessary for cardiac contraction, calcium in high doses is actually going to cause suppression of our skeletal muscle. We can start to get fractures. We can start to get, and here, here's a big one right here, renal calculi, in other words, stones. We're going to get urinary tract stones because the calcium is going to bind up into these little, basically, bones, right? Calcium forms bone. So this calcium binds together, forms this hard rock, in other words, a renal stone, and clogs up the kidneys or clogs up the urinary tract.
Hypoparathyroidism, on the other hand, is going to lead to the patient having low levels of calcium. So again, we're going to take a look at that parathyroid gland. A lot of times, most of the times, hypoparathyroidism is going to be the result of somebody having too much of the parathyroid gland removed. So they were doing surgery on the thyroid and they damaged the parathyroid or they removed too much of the parathyroid gland and now we're in a hypoparathyroid situation. This will result in just the opposite problems. So a low calcium level, uh, low calcium will, on the bones, it'll cause tetany, it'll cause the bones to go into, I'm sorry, it'll cause the muscles to go into spasm and cause tetany and muscle spasms and even life-threatening events like seizures could happen as a result of having a low calcium level. You might have also noticed that parathyroid hormone, a low parathyroid hormone, is going to cause the patient to have a low magnesium level too. Remember, magnesium is necessary for the absorption and utilization of other electrolytes. The pancreas has a couple different functions. It has endocrine functions. It has exocrine functions. Okay, so it can have functions that are going to be both as an endocrine and an exocrine gland. Let's talk about some of the different pieces we have and some of the different hormones that come from the pancreas. Most notably, the islands of Langerhans are going to be secreting glucagon and insulin. Insulin, very important in the body because it's going to help to decrease our blood glucose levels. So it helps to control the amount of blood glucose that we have circulating in the body. However, insulin is also very necessary for us to be able to synthesize, to be able to make new proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. In fact, insulin is looked at a lot for people who are exercising and how to control their insulin levels because insulin will help to help to the person to be able to build new muscle. So we want to control those insulin levels. Insulin is also, of course, very involved in the process of how much glucose we put away into storage. In other words, <laughs> read fat, right? Okay, so how much of our carbohydrates, etc., are put away into fat is controlled by insulin as well. So we're trying to manipulate our insulin levels a little bit in some of our patients, not only just people who have diabetes, but also people who may have weight problems, etc. We can control insulin secretion by the type of food the person's taking at what time of the day. Very interesting in some of the research that's being done on insulin. The primary function of insulin, though, is to decrease our blood glucose level, control our blood glucose levels, so that we have a nice steady blood glucose level level throughout our day. Glucagon, on the other hand, is secreted and it's designed to do just the opposite of insulin. In other words, it's going to be stimulated by having a low glucose level and it's going to stimulate glyconeogenesis. Okay, glyconeogenesis and glycogenesis is the production of new glucose. It's also going to cause lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat in order to produce more glucose in the body. So here's our pancreas just showing some of the different cells we have here. The alpha cells, as you look down at the bottom picture, the blow up of that pancreas and the pancreatic areas. So you can see we have our alpha cells there that are secreting glucagon. We have our beta cells that are secreting insulin. Notice also we have these other cells over on the right side acini cells which are secreting our digestive enzymes because remember the pancreas not only produces insulin and glucagon so it's also not just that endocrine uh, type of organ but it's also an exocrine organ and it's producing our enzymes that are used in digestion this is where we end up with pancreatitis those secreted enzymes are released in too much in, in large quantities and that starts to digest the pancreas Diabetes mellitus is a situation where the patient is not producing a normal amount of insulin or we have abnormal resistance to insulin occurring in the body. So let's stick with type 1 for a moment here, or diabetes mellitus. Type 1 also previously called juvenile onset diabetes. In juvenile onset or type 1 diabetes, this is a situation where the person has an absolute insulin deficit. So they are lacking insulin. Insulin just plain isn't there. So they, they don't have it. And since they don't have enough insulin in their body, their blood glucose becomes very high. Now these other symptoms that we see associated down here, polydipsia, polyuria, that's all the result of having a high glucose level. So high glucose in the bloodstream causes the blood to become thicker.
Okay, it causes an increase in osmolality, concentration, right? So we have an increase in the concentration of our blood, which means that that's going to stimulate the kidneys to try to get rid of that extra glucose. Now, they, the kidneys have a cutoff point for glucose, and when glucose reaches about 250 in the bloodstream, so our glucose level hits about 250, the kidneys have this cutoff, this threshold for glucose, and they're going to start saying, hey, you know what, we need to dump glucose. There's too much glucose on board. So it's kind of a backup mechanism. But when the kidneys start dumping glucose, guess what follows? Water. So we have polyuria. So we have an increase. We have frequent urination. Because we have frequent urination, we're going to have polydipsia. Okay, again, we also have concentrated serum. Our serum osmolality is high. So that's going to cause the person to feel like they need to drink. They're going to feel dehydrated. They're going to feel like they need to drink. And we have polydipsia. Polyphagia is eating a lot. Okay, so the person's going to be eating more frequently because they're not using their glucose. Even though the glucose is high in the bloodstream, they're not using it. So the tissues in the body are saying, hey, we're starving down here because we need insulin to push the glucose into the cell. So since the, the insulin isn't there, we're not able to push the glucose into the cell. It stays in the bloodstream. It doesn't get into the cells. And so the cells are saying, hey, we're starving down here. Eat, eat, eat. We need more. And that's where we get the weight loss from. Now, the fatigue is going to come from the high glucose. It's going to come from the inability to be able to use glucose because insulin isn't pushing it into the cells. And that's where we get our fatigue from. Eventually, when the glucose level gets high enough, the patient is going to start to have changes in mental status and potentially even a change in level of consciousness. Type 2 diabetes, on the other hand, also called adult onset diabetes. Now, these are not necessarily, uh, you know, situations that are always occur. In other words, you can have somebody with type 1 diabetes uh, and it, it starts occurring in their adulthood. So just because we used to call it uh, juvenile onset and adult onset, that it doesn't follow all the way across the board. But just I'm just telling you those names just because that may be something you can relate to. You've heard that before. Somebody else has mentioned those names too. Type 2 diabetes is more commonly going to happen to somebody in later in life, and this is something that can to some extent be controlled. In other words, we can control this with diet and exercise in many of our patients. So if we control their diet, we control their exercise, we can control some of the resistance that the body has to their insulin. Remember, again, we're looking at a lot of ways that we can manipulate diet now in order to be able to control insulin release and control insulin function in the body. Type 2 diabetes is one of those situations that uh, where somebody who, you know, you think about it, I think the common perception is that we have somebody here who's overweight, who doesn't exercise, and that's a person who's developing type 2 diabetes. And in a lot of cases, that is true. And if we start exercise and we start uh, dieting appropriately for this person, then they will be able to control their blood sugar without having to do anything else. But typically what happens in type 2 diabetes is, is one of two things. We either have insulin resistance, which means the cells in the body are not going to respond to this person's insulin, or we're going to have a situation where insulin is being produced, but it is not effective. The insulin itself is not effective. So there's something wrong with the insulin that's being produced. So that's why we call it insulin resistance is because the insulin, the, the target cells may be resistant to the insulin or we may have ineffective insulin and the target cells are fine. It's just that the insulin isn't working. So we would treat that in a different way depending upon what we think is going on. So there's a number of different drugs that can be used for type 2 diabetes to control the patient's blood glucose. Uh, usually those are going to be oral medications as opposed to type 1 diabetes, the patient almost always needs to be receiving insulin injections. Complications of diabetes are many. We're going to talk about a couple of these here in a few moments. We're going to talk about hypoglycemia, diabetic ketoacidosis, and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic coma. These three situations are life-threatening conditions that can occur in your patient, so that's why we want to know about them in detail. Also, we need to know about the four things at the bottom of the page. Those are things that are going to happen over a longer period of time. So over a long period of time, that high blood glucose is going to lead to macrovascular disease. In other words, we're going to get atherosclerotic, atherosclerotic disease or atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis is going to occur. Your patient could develop a myocardial infarction or a stroke or a bowel infarction. All those different conditions that result as a result of atherosclerotic disease. Neuropathies can also occur. Neuropathies occur 
as a result of two things going on. One, the high blood glucose is causing difficulty with the neurons being able to function appropriately. Secondly, because of macrovascular and microvascular disease, there's decreased perfusion to the periphery, and that causes ischemia of the nerves, and that leads to neuropathies. Infection is more prevalent in patients who have diabetes. The reason for this is the high blood glucose level is going to have a negative effect. It's going to suppress our immune system and not allow the immune system to work as well as it should. Then lastly, we have microvascular disease, and we actually have destruction of the vessels themselves in the body that's being caused by this high chronically high blood glucose level and that's called microvascular disease that causes blindness renal failure it causes the neuropathies that occur in our patients so lots of long-term complications as a result of microvascular disease so let's get on to talking about those life-threatening complications that can occur as a result of having diabetes there's two ways that the body can end up having a high blood glucose level, a high blood sugar level. And probably the easier way to remember this or to think about it is to think about it in terms of making a pitcher of lemonade. We're going to make a pitcher of lemonade here and we want to make it sweeter. Well, there's two ways you can make that sweeter. You can add more sugar to it or you can add less water. Either way, you're going to end up making that lemonade sweeter. Adding more sugar to the lemonade is like DKA. Adding less water, taking away some of that water, is going to be like HHNK. Okay, let's take a look at those and see how those things fit in. DKA is a problem that occurs in type 1 diabetics. It is the result of having poor medical control. So either we have too much glucose in the body, the patient's taking in too much glucose or not enough insulin. So we have poor medical control, which is resulting in the person having a high blood glucose level. Typically, the blood glucose level, it says here 150 to 600, but typically you're going to see those blood glucose levels in a range of about 350 to 600 in DKA. Now, the blood glucose level could go higher than 600. It could be 800, 1,000, or 1,200. could be higher than 600, but typically we're going to see it in about the range of 350 to 600. Onset of DKA is within hours, so your patient was fine this morning by lunchtime the patient has DKA and is more common in type 1 diabetics. The first symptom that's going to happen when somebody has a change in their blood glucose level, the first symptom we will see will be a change in their mental status. We'll see a change in their mental status. That's the first thing that will occur. Fruity breath odor is going to occur as a result of breaking down fat. Okay, so that's an acetone type of a breath odor. We get warm, dry skin. Kuzmal's respirations, which are going to be deep, rapid respirations, and that is a compensatory mechanism to the acidosis. Okay, we'll see what's happening there in a minute. Our treatment for this is going to be to give the person insulin and to give the person fluids. Let's take a look at this slide here. Our insulin deficit is causing a glucose excess, and the glucose excess causes an osmotic diuresis, so the patient ends up becoming dehydrated. So the patient does need some fluid. On the other hand, the insulin deficiency is causing increased fat metabolism. Ketones are produced. That's what causes the acetone breath, the sweet smell of the breath, fruit, fruit, the fruity odor to the breath, and acidosis causes a metabolic acidosis. The person's response, the compensatory response to a metabolic acidosis is hyperventilation, or in other words, respiratory compensation. That's where we're getting our Kuzmal's respirations. So the way we want to treat this is we want to turn off that initiating factor over in the upper left-hand corner is going to be the insulin deficit. Turn that thing off and we'll turn off all the rest. So we give insulin. Now we do need to replace some fluid because the patient's had an osmotic diuresis. The other condition is called HHS or HHNK. I'm going to use the term HHS here. These things mean the same thing. HHNK, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic coma. That terminology is not really accurate. Non-ketotic, well, patients who have HHNK can develop ketones. They can develop ketones. It's not a result of 
the lack of insulin, but in fact it's a result of having decreased perfusion to the tissues that causes the person to develop the ketones. So ketones can be present. So non-ketotic is probably not a good definition. The last part of that is coma. Well, only about 10% of patients in HHS develop coma. So they decided that maybe we should rename this HHS hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome. You may see it written either way. I'm giving you both definitions just so you have it, just so that you can uh, hopefully kind of tuck that away somewhere and, and understand it if you hear it in different ways. HHS or HHNK is more common in type 2 diabetics. The onset is in days, and the blood glucose levels are very, very high, usually greater than 800. So we're usually seeing a blood glucose 800, 1,000, 1,200, very, very high blood glucose levels. The cause for HHS is dehydration. Remember, we can make that pitcher of lemonade sweeter by adding more sugar or by taking away some of the water. What happens in HHS is taking away the water. Now we have a high blood glucose, not because of a lack of insulin, but because of dehydration. Now, would this happen in somebody who does not have type 2 diabetes? Unlikely. Remember, in type 2 diabetes, our insulin doesn't work well. Maybe it works well enough to get us through the typical day, but when the person is stressed, they have severe dehydration going on. The patient's had the flu for the last week, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, can't keep anything down, they got severe dehydration. In that situation, the insulin isn't going to work well enough in order to maintain a normal blood glucose and the glucose level gets high. And it's because we're taking away the water, not because we're adding more sugar. Symptoms are shock. The patient presents in tachycardia, hypotension, signs of shock because of the loss of the fluid volume. Decreased level of consciousness. Again, we can get some Kuzmal's respirations. Our treatment, again, would be to give fluids and insulin. However, the problem is an imbalance between glucose and water. So our primary treatment is not going to be insulin, but instead going to be water, giving the fluid. However, if this patient has a blood glucose of 1,200 and we give them fluid, a lot of that fluid is just going to be diuresed out. So we're going to give a little insulin, a lot of water, a lot of fluid in this patient with HHS. Opposite side of the coin is the patient has hypoglycemia. We have a low glucose level. Remember that the brain is totally dependent upon getting enough glucose in order to be able to run the vital functions of the brain. So we need to have an adequate glucose level. So make sure that your patient is getting an adequate amount of glucose. And hypoglycemia is the situation here that is going to be imminently deadly. So the other two situations... We have DKA, HHS, those things are obviously going to have long-term consequences, and we don't want our patient to stay in those situations very long. But in hypoglycemia, we may be down to a situation where we have a period of minutes before we start having damage occurring to the brain. How this occurs is we have an inadequate diet. The person's not getting the glucose in the diet. They're taking insulin. So your patient's in the hospital, they're NPO, they're not getting their food, and they are getting insulin. We can end up with hypoglycemia. Be careful and watch those blood glucose levels. We don't want to be giving insulin to somebody whose blood glucose is already fairly low. First sign is a change in mental status. Have you noticed that consistently all the way through? All of these glucose problems result in a change in mental status first? Our treatment is going to be, let's give glucose. Now the American Diabetes Association recommends that we're going to give the person food. Give them a food tray. Give them some food. Okay, so we want to feed the patient first in order to be able to get that glucose level up. If we can't feed the patient because they're already unconscious, then we're going to start working on the simple sugars and maybe even giving the patient some glucose by way of the IV. Well, this is the end of section one. Uh, let's continue on to section two and talk a little bit more about our alterations in endocrine and hormonal regulation.